Hi there. This is chapter four of Listen, Feeding. Twice more along the trail, Charlie has to stop and rest. Once on a boulder and the other time on a tree stump. She hasn't seen the wild dogs since Hawk Pond, she thinks as she sits on the stump. So she's been saved from herself. She doesn't have to keep her promise if he doesn't come with her to get fed. Sadie can swim home and Charlie will take the can of dog food back to Mrs. Davis the next time, weeks and weeks from now. She feels like walking all the way around the lake. No sooner than she had thought this, than she catches a glimpse of movement and sees a red gold form slip cro quickly across the trail back along the ridge she just walked. If she hadn't stopped to rest, she had never have known that he was still there. Somehow, he can move through the woods with no sound at all. Sadie is another story. Charging around in the dead leaves, splashing into the water to take a swim when the trail winds down near the lake, coming back to shake off on Charlie, then rolling on the ground to dry herself. Charlie could have closed her eyes any time on the walk and known exactly where Sadie was. Besides that, no raccoon or muskrat, no fox or beaver with half a brain would show, that, show its face within a mile of Sadie. This is why she has never had a dog. Nature photography requires patience and stillness and quiet. Nothing chasing animals away. You do that, right, Xana? Yes. But there is no one doing nature photography anymore. She can have a dog now if she wants. When she and Sadie come down out of the woods and cross the embankment at Heron Pond, the smaller of the two ponds, half choked with cattails, Charlie hasn't seen the wild dog again, but she knows now that not seeing him doesn't mean that he isn't around somewhere amongst the trees keeping pace with them. She is picking her way across the Heron Pond, spill spill away on broken chunks of concrete, listening to the cheerful sound of the waterfall where the water slides over a tumble of boulders on its way to the lake, when Sadie runs past her, splashing her with mud and water. It feels so good on her hot, sticky skin that she wishes she could climb down and sit under the waterfall, letting it wash away the sweat and grime. What she wants more, though, is to get home wash the poison ivy off, take a pain pill, and lie down for a while. At last, she emerges from the trees onto the broad swath of trail that is the sewer line access for the house developments up beyond the woods that surround Eagle Lake. Every couple of years, the utilities people come with a truck and mow down the poison ivy and blackberry brambles, the honeysuckle and sweet gum saplings that grow so fast and thick that they practically choke off the trail between cuttings. She follows it across a tiny creek and up the last slope to the chain that stretches across the end of Eagle Lake Drive. The chain is low enough to step over. Jasmine and Bernie, the two German shepherds who live at the last house on the north side of the lake, bark at Sadie from their pen down near where the water, down near the water as she goes by. Sadie stays well away. Jasmine, the younger German Shepherd, sometimes attacks other female dogs, so Mr. Garrison, their owner, keeps them penned while he's at work. When Charlie gets home, Sadie is with her, but the wild dog is not. As she starts down the driveway toward the house, she hears Jasmine and Bernie barking again. A minute later, the wild dog comes down the road, shoulders hunched, nose up, sniffing for danger. He really does look like a coyote, Charlie thinks, rangy and wild. As she watches him, braving the open road to follow them, his eyes meet hers for a moment. Again, there is that feeling like an electrical current between them. <sighs> coyote. She thinks the word toward him as if she were saying it out loud. That's your name, Coyote. You're Xana. <laughs> I know, I love you. She makes her way down the driveway, up the ramp, and through the sliding door into the dining room. The vacuum cleaner is running in her father's bedroom. Sarita, 
her eternal jigsaw puzzle, abandoned on its table by the windows overlooking the lake, is working. Sarita, she yells, not sure she can be heard. I'm back. The vacuum stops. You okay? Yeah. It isn't true, but as long as she isn't actually dead, she's okay enough for Sarita. Charlie figures she's just another chore for this woman who her father pays to run the household, like the laundry or a room that needs vacuuming. She takes the can of dog food into the kitchen and opens it, then gets out the heavy serving bowl. Hurrying, she spoons out the food, cube-shaped chunks of meat with gravy, and goes to see if the dog is still out there. If Sadie starts for home, Coyote will surely follow her. It takes her a minute to spot him across the road, almost in the woods, standing and watching the house. She sets the bowl on the buffet and opens the sliding door. Then, stick in one hand, bowl in the other, she steps out onto the ramp. Instantly, the dog disappears into the woods. Charlie can hear Sadie swimming for home, making big splashes with her front paws the way she does. Lunchtime, Charlie calls the wild dog she can't see anymore. Come and get it. She limps out to the end of the drive and sets the bowl down where the cement meets the gravel. Lunchtime, she calls again. Charlie steps back from the food and waits for the dog to come out. He doesn't. So she turns around and goes back into the house. When she gets to the ramp, she turns to watch. Still, the dog doesn't come out. Finally, she goes all the way back inside and closes the sliding door. She moves to the dining room window to watch. Sarita, tall and lean as a heron in her faded blue jeans and navy t-shirt, comes down the hall from the bedroom. What's up? There is no way to know what Sarita would have would think of having a dog in the house. She is as communicative as a statue. But it isn't Sarita Charlie has to convince. It's her father. Charlie motions Sarita to the narrow window by the front door. Watch, out on the drive. The dog comes out of the woods and stands for a moment looking towards the house. Then he crouches down low to the ground and begins to creep up on the food dish, as if it might be booby-dropped. He sniffs at it quickly, then backs away. He looks to his right, he looks to his left, and over his shoulder, sniffs again, then begins creeping forward, his tail tightly tucked between his legs. He wants the food, Charlie can see that. He really wants it, but he seems terrified of it too. Finally, standing as far back from the bowl as he possibly can, he stretches his neck to reach the food. He wolfs a couple of the bites and then backs up to check all around again, muscles tensed and ready to run. That's the stray from the other side of the lake, Sarita says. How'd you know about him? Saw him a couple times by the mailboxes. Scooted off when he saw me, though, scruffy-looking thing. The dog goes on eating, gulping quickly, stopping every couple of mouthfuls to check for danger. When he finishes, he slips back into the woods. Mrs. Davis said nobody can get near that dog, Sarita says. Nobody can. So how come you're feeding him? Because he's hungry. It is more, more than that, she knows, but Charlie can't explain it even to herself. I'm thinking maybe he could come with, live with us. Huh, Sarita says and runs a hand over her fine frizz of gray hair. What's your father going to say? I don't know. Whatever he says, Charlie thinks, surprised at how strongly she feels, suddenly she will find a way to have this dog in her life. And that is the end of chapter four.